Welcome back to Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a brief overview, a very brief overview of the history of economics, focusing in on the history of macro. The idea here is really just to highlight how juvenile the field of macroeconomics is as a field of study. Uh, what we're also going to do to kind of finish off this video is to take a look at a bit more detail on GDP. Specifically, we're going to take a look at some limitations of GDP and where maybe I have a bit, uh, maybe a bit dramatically called it the failures of GDP. So with that, we'll also be taking a look at some alternatives that exist out there that have been recommended to be utilized instead of GDP. And without further ado, well, let's go get started and take a look at some of our history. So to get started, right, what we've said is to start off with macro. Uh, macro, it helps if I can spell macro. There we go. With macro, what we're really looking at is the study of the aggregation of markets. So let's, let's get that down. Our aggregation of markets. We're not just looking at, hey, what's the market for jackets or the market for shoes or anything like that. We're looking at all the markets within a nation state or within a region, within a broader economy, a broader context. Micro, micro then is a single market. Just that market for jackets, just that market for shoes, etc. Well, Micro theory has really been around for a long time. To be honest, really economics, it goes back to the ancient Greeks. That's where the word comes from. That's where the field really first began to exist. Early philosophers. From here though, really modern economics as we know it, with modern microeconomics as we know it, really can be thrown back to Adam Smith. Adam Smith, in his Wealth of Nations in 1776, began to lay a lot of the basic theory, a lot of the basic understandings of what we have that developed into our modern study, our modern understanding of economics. Adding to it, we have David Ricardo. David Ricardo, we will look at some of Ricardo's theories that we still end up utilizing. Uh, David Ricardo, Ricardo's piece on the principles of political economy and taxation, that was released in 1817. And we will look specifically as we move through this course, we'll take a little bit of a look at a concept known as Ricardian equivalence and Ricardian trade theory, which of course throw back to David Ricardo. And you're like, what? Why are we looking at those in macro? Well, because although macro is the aggregation of markets, it's a little bit of a different field. It is ultimately just the aggregation of micro. So that is a lot of the concepts. Well, the theory developed here will also apply over to the macro side. A uh, final name that we can throw in here, another big name in early uh, field of microeconomics would be Alfred Marshall who we really have to thank for our kind of our modern supply and demand diagrams, our workhorse model of explaining the economy around us in, their, in his, I guess, Principles of Economics of 1890. So just a brief overview of some big thinkers, and by no means are these names any more or less important than many other big thinkers that establish the field, but just kind of a big uh, list, uh, not a big list, but a list of some of the big names that help to kind of start the field of microeconomics. The idea here really is to show that this has been a field of study, of advancement, of theory, philosophizing, testing, rejecting tests, coming up with new ideas, accepting them, building off of them, et cetera, et cetera, for almost 300 years right, for quite a long time, going back to the late 1700s. If you want to include the ancient Greeks, much, much, much longer, right, much longer. Macro, however, macro, however, is by comparison to most arts and sciences, relatively new. Uh, macro as it's defined as its distinct field of study, arguably can be thrown back to 
John Maynard Keynes. In Keynes's work, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, which was published in 1936. That is, by comparison, less than 100 years old. From here, we have other kind of competing views that have existed in macro, hardly a unified, hardly a consensus field of study. We have Frederick Hayek. Uh, Frederick Hayek. In his work, The Road to Serfdom in 1944. And we have the rise of what is often known as, so if you take a look at this, if you want to think about kind of what fields of study each one is attached to, Keynes is attached to what is known as Keynesian economics or the Keynesian view of our economy. Uh, Frederick Hayek is often linked up with the Austrian school of economics, although there's some debate if that's honestly a good fit. And then last one, again, last one we're going to look at here, by far not an exhaustive list, would be Milton Friedman with our Chicago School of Economics. And Milton Friedman's piece, A Monetary History of the United States of 1867 to 1960, which was published in 1963. So, okay. Are these names relevant? Are these dates relevant? Do you need to know this? No, 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 no. Right? This isn't an economic history course. The point of this really is to highlight big thinkers in micro going back to the late 1700s. That is, we have had lots of time for this scientific process to build upon itself, right? And for those of you maybe not familiar with this whole idea of the scientific process, hey, I have an idea. Hmm, is it true? Is it not true? I come up with a hypothesis that is an idea that I can test. I then create a test for it. I test, I either accept my idea or I fail to accept my idea. That is, I reject it. If I accept my idea, I publish it and I go, hey, I have this new thing that I have proof to support. Other people look at that and they go, hey, that's cool. I think I can build off of it. Or they go, hey, that's cool, but I disagree with you, and I think I can disprove it. And then we disprove it, right? So that is, in micro, we've had about 300 years of this scientific process, of ideas, of theories being presented, being tweaked, being refined, being built upon. Micro, as a result, is a far more specific, a far more accurate field of study. Macro, on the other hand, Arguably, as a specific field of study, there's always been macro ideas throwing back, right? Adam Smith talked about money. He talked about monetary policy to a degree, exchange rates, all things we'll talk about that affect macro, right? So some of these concepts have always been involved, but the idea of a unified macroeconomic theory arguably began in 1930s, after the Great Depression. So that being said, relatively new field of study, less time for the scientific process to go through, less time for these theories to be refined, built upon, rejected, and to be more specific. So macro is the field that often gets a lot of criticism, often gets a lot of criticism in the media as failing, as making mistakes, as not being, not giving us good results. Well, yeah, it's a juvenile field. In the scheme of things, this is a baby, right? This isn't even 100 years old yet. You look at other fields, physics, biology, chemistry. These are hundreds of years old, right? Far before the 1700s even. So what we're getting into, and this is really where I find macro an exciting field, is that it's a young field. It's a field that still has lots of refining to be done in it. There is a lot of these theories that, hey, Right now, we have consensus with. Right now, we believe this is a good way of explaining the economy. Give it another 50 years, and we might say, you know what? That theory was hogwash. We now have this new, exciting way that we can explain it that's much more precise, much better. So all that to say, this is a very juvenile field of study. So that's some brief history on the idea, on the 
foundation of macroeconomics, let's jump over and let's take a look at this idea of GDP and the nature of GDP. So with GDP, and maybe better we can say as I had, the nature of GDP is that it's important to realize that GDP is a foundation, it's a fundamental part of macro, it's the primary metric which we will utilize to measure the health and the wealth of a nation, and is often used synonymously with standard of living. That is, the higher the GDP, or maybe more specifically, the higher the GDP per capita, well, the better off, the higher the standard of living the people are, the people have, rather, within that nation. But keep in mind, GDP is not a metric we just observed in the wild and gave a name to, right? It's not a natural phenomenon. GDP is a construct. Uh, it helps if I use the right tool. GDP is a construct of accounting and economics. It is a beast that we created. It is something that we created that we chose as to what is included and what is not included. And beyond this, it's a relatively new construct. That is, Canada only adopted to begin to measure GDP, right? So, Canada began measuring GDP in 1986. So not that long ago in the scheme of things. That's what? Only 34 years ago. That's relatively recent in the grand scheme of things. Before that, we had other measures to kind of determine the health and wealth of a nation. And that is before we utilized GDP, well, before gross domestic product, we utilized another measure known as GNP, gross national product, slightly different in what it's measuring. It's kind of the precursor to GDP. And before either of those, what we often utilize to kind of determine, again, that health and the wealth of a nation, to compare one nation to another, is just raw production data. Raw production data. That is, we would take a look at, hey, how many tons of iron ore has this country produced versus how many tons of iron ore has that country produced? How many battleships has this country produced to that country? How many trinkets were created here versus there? Right? So this kind of information, and in fact, if you take a look, if you're ever in a history class or a political science class that's kind of looking at the rise of nations, it's this raw production data that's utilized to compare, say, Germany to France in the rise of Germany leading up to World War I. Just, hey, look at the amount that Germany was able to produce in iron versus France versus Britain versus the U.S. And that was utilized as kind of a proxy as to the overall power or the overall output production capabilities of Germany. So this raw production data or this freight data, that is how much stuff is being shipped, from one place to another is what was often utilized before GDP to measure the health and the wealth of a nation. So all of this really to say GDP, gross domestic product, is a relatively new metric in which we utilize to measure the health and the wealth of a nation. It doesn't mean that it's going to be the metric we use forever. Like I said, relatively juvenile field. Likely, maybe we'll find a better or more imaginative way to measure the health and wealth of a nation. But for now, this is what we utilize. With that, what are some of the critiques of GDP? Well, some of the critiques of GDP is that GDP does not measure. What's important? Right? And that is, if we take a look at GDP through either our income side or our expenditure side, well, it's just looking at, well, what are the sources of income that we earn? How much income is being earned versus, hey, what are we spending our money on? And really, what that's missing is it's not measuring what's important. That is, it's leaving out a lot of important things, such as 
leisure. How much time off do we have to relax? How much time off do we have to enjoy ourselves? We might have huge levels of GDP, really high levels of GDP per capita, but it's because we're working 60-hour work weeks. We're not enjoying our days. We're burning ourselves out. It doesn't include a metric or some attempt to measure happiness, right? We might have a really good level of GDP, a really high standard of living is the way we'd synonymously say that, but everybody might be miserable. So ah, there might be an issue there. GDP does not measure equity or equality. Maybe that's important. Maybe it's not. GDP does not measure corruption. Maybe we've been able to get a high level of GDP by cheating and stealing our way, by having a kleptocracy to get that. Ah, uh, that maybe isn't good. So GDP, again, does not account for that. It does not account for health. It does not account for how healthy it is. It does not account for rates of suicide. So that would be mental health on that side. What's the mental health of a nation? Again, does not get included in GDP. So, ah, some big things missing, right? We could throw in a bunch of other kind of things that is not included. We don't include what technologies are available to us. That is, are we making this high level of GDP using just a whole bunch of oxen and standard plows and horse and just amazing that we're able to get the high level of GDP that we are? Or, hey, do we have extremely high levels of technology and we have this GDP because we just allow technology and everything to be automated, right? What's, what's that level going on there? What about our freedoms? Do we have lots of freedom or do we have very, very few freedoms? Are freedoms important to us, right? GDP does not account, does not account for these freedoms at all. So that's potentially a problem. It also doesn't account for crime. It doesn't account for criminal activity. Right? Crime is not included. Criminal activity is not included on the income side. Criminal expenditure is not accounted for in the expenditure side. So GDP doesn't account for any of that. Uh, interesting aside on that, Great Britain actually includes now expenditure on criminal activities or what they would consider criminal activities such as certain illicit drugs and prostitution. They now account for that in their calculations of GDP. Uh, if you want to do a quick Google search of that, there's some actual really interesting articles which discuss it. If I remember to, I'll link them in the comments of this video as well. What else does GDP lack? Well, GDP also, and this is arguably a big one where GDP comes underneath a lot of criticism today, is GDP doesn't encounter or doesn't account for anything with the environment. Right? There's nothing at all to do with the environment here. And in fact, one of the big kind of things that ends up happening is when we try to put in new reforms, new environmental reforms to make the environment healthier, to kind of minimize our pollution, one of the big kickbacks is, well, what will that do to our GDP? What will that do to our businesses? Right? And that is because we're more interested in how much stuff we're able to produce than the environmental impacts. How much stuff we're able to produce rather than happiness. How much stuff we're able to produce rather than the health of the people, rather than the level of corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So GDP does not include any of these things. And to many who critique GDP, this is a huge fallback of it. Farther, many criticize GDP and they say that the problem with GDP is that tragedies, tragedies boost GDP. And this is in part true. War, natural disaster, huge outbreaks like this, they're actually boosts to GDP. And that is, if we think about it, if we think about GDP from the expenditure side, we said, hey, GDP expenditure side was our consumption plus our investment plus our government purchases, our government spending, plus our net exports. Well, hey, if we have war going on, 
the government is going to be spending a lot of money on what they would call defense spending. A lot of money on their military, a lot of money on new soldiers, on new equipment, etc., etc., etc. If we have a hurricane, a forest fire, an earthquake, all of these kind of things, well, what ends up happening? The government spends a ton of money on relief efforts. All of this is an increase in government spending. All else constant, an increase in government spending will cause a boost to GDP. So arguably the problem there is that tragedies are accounted in GDP. And there's kind of a famous saying that if you want to boost GDP, go around breaking windows. And right, what, why? Well, because if you go around breaking windows, you need to fix those windows. You need to go pay the glazier to come and put in new windows to create new windows and put them in. So in that case there, if you go around breaking windows, you're creating jobs by creating work for the window repairman. So tragedies boost GDP, right? Kind of a problem with the way that we currently measure it. So are there any alternatives? Are there any additions, any kind of tweaks we can make to GDP? Yeah, yeah, there are. And I'm not going to get into them because there's massive amounts available on all of these. I'm just kind of here to kind of make you aware that alternatives do exist. But right now, the consensus is that we utilize GDP. Right now, GDP is our primary metric. So that being said, here are some of the alternatives. The first alternative that we'll take a look at is known as the Fordham Index of Social Health. That's the Fordham Index of Social Health, or the FISH metric. And this FISH metric, well, really what it's taking a look at is, well, index of social health. How healthy is the nation on whole? And again, if you're interested in knowing more about any of these, feel free to look into them. They are very interesting into what exactly they include or don't include. And for some of these, they are meant to be used in conjunction with GDP. For some of them, they are actually being recommended as a replacement, a substitute to GDP. So the FISH, the Fordham Index of Social Health, would be used in conjunction with GDP. That is, we'd still keep utilizing GDP, but we would also take a look at this metric as well. We would also have what was known as the Genuine Progress Indicator, the GPI. Genuine progress indicator, which is again another indicator that would be used in conjunction with GDP. And it looks a lot more at situations like equality, corruption, health, crime, etc., etc., etc. Interesting thing with these two metrics that I've just introduced here, if we look back over the last few decades, if we take a look at GDP versus the fish, GDP versus the GPI, in both the USA and Canada, well, real GDP, uh, GDP, has been rising. In the USA, well, this fish or this GPI has been uh, arguably falling. That is, we've seen a separation of output, what we would often synonymously call our standard of living, and other metrics that truthfully attempt to measure standard of living, health, happiness, that kind of idea, equality, equity. So in the USA, we see a separation between the two. In Canada, well, real GDP has been going up, and we've witnessed more or less a similar increase in fish and the GPI, right? It's not been perfect. In some cases, real GDP has outpaced the other two. But in Canada, we've seen this kind of more or less pace for pace growth in both GDP and these alternative measures of happiness as well. So, yeah, you could say Canada, we've been doing pretty good. In the USA, you've definitely seen a separation of the two. What else do we have? We have some different ones. Um, we'll have this one standing on its own is the UND, uh, sorry, UNHDI, 
That is the United Nations, UN, United Nations Human Development Index. So the UN Human Development <clears throat> Index. This one, well, yes, it's been developed by the UN in order to kind of measure, okay, from a human perspective, how are we developing, right? And mostly amongst developed countries, are they actually developing in an equal way? Do they have massive corruption? How's their health care? What's crime like? All of these big factors that are not accounted for in measures of GDP. So the UN Human Development Index. There's also two other indices that include environmental factors into our GDP, and arguably this could be used almost in substitution to our GDP, but maybe arguably, right? There's a lot of argument. There's a lot of division amongst these. This one here would be the gross sustainable development product. So the gross sustainable development product gross sustainable development product. And this takes a look at environmental factors. That is, hey, are we sustainably growing our output? Product, output, very synonymous terms. Is it sustainable in this way? So hey, it's just like GDP, but with sustainable being thrown in front of it. Another environmental one that is often looked at or is being argued as a good alternative to GDP that includes environmental indices would be the GESDI. The GESDI. And what does that stand for? Well, that is our gross environmental. I'm just going to abbreviate that to enviro. Sustainable. Development Index. So the Gross Environmental Sustainable Development Index. That's a mouthful. GESDI. Again, these two here, they specifically include environmental concerns. So two and other additional indices of interest to look at as well. So again, the purpose of this wasn't to go in detail as to what each of these alternatives to GDP include. It wasn't to say, hey, this one's better than that one or anything of the like. All this was to kind of say, hey, we do have alternatives to GDP out there. And these are just first five that kind of are the big ones that I'm more familiar with. There are many, many more out there, of course. So many alternatives being proposed to GDP to overcome or to attempt to overcome all or some of these problems of what GDP does not measure. And by no means is this an exhaustive list either. So, okay, that does us for this video. What was the gist of it? What were we going through? The outcome of this video was really just kind of fluffy, just a bunch of talk and discussion to have you kind of understand the history of macro, that it's a relatively young field, and then following that to understand many of the main fallbacks of GDP. That, hey, GDP is not this natural thing in the world that we witnessed and then just gave a name to. It is a construct. It's something that we created. It is like an accounting. It is an economic construct that we decided to utilize to measure human progress, to measure the progress of national, national growth. So that being said, it can change. It can change if it needed to be. It's a relatively new one, only since 1986 have we used it in Canada. And of course, it's been along, around for much longer. And the big part there is that there are other alternatives out there. Out of this, of course, is always the big discussion. Should we keep utilizing GDP? Or should we utilize a different metric? If we utilize a different metric, what does that mean? What does that mean for all of our macro theory? How do things fit together? Maybe we keep GDP, maybe we augment GDP or add to GDP a weighted kind of metric with one of these other alternatives that includes kind of facets of happiness, facets of the environment, of our health, of the level of corruption or equity within a nation. Right? These alternatives do exist.
If you have any questions about this video, please feel free to reach out. Either post in the comments below, post on the Frequently Asked Questions board on D2L, or feel free, of course, to reach out to me via email. Thanks. Until next time.